All venomous creatures, I've noticed this with bees, you know, the honey bees, the way they behave around me, many, many times I've noticed is very strange. In the beginning when it happened, I couldn't believe how these insects seem to be sensing something which nobody else, you know, human beings don't know most of the time. When you susceptible to ocean, usually it affects the skin. Modern medicine dismissed as rubbish, superstitious. But we can get you certain cases of skin ailment. Do what you want, you cannot diagnose what it is. For sure you cannot cure with your medicine. You know, in India, there are people that if you have a snake bite, Just by uttering a mantra, they will relieve you of your poison. Do you know this? Long distance. You heard of this man who became very famous, Romani, Karnataka. In a way, it's a curse from the snake. When you get it, it's a curse, isn't it? Can I ask you two questions? Yes, sir. So, you mentioned this instrument that permits us to access this, uh, whatever we call it, consciousness, intelligence, uh, but you say it's, it's for humans. So, what do you think about animals and how they perceive the world? And then the second question is this terribly um, challenging one. If you say that um, somehow, and, and you make the comparison with the bubble and, and that there is no such thing as your consciousness, my consciousness, it could be an illusion. So, how do we somehow uh, deal with, well, what was there before you were born and what will there be when you're dead? So, these two are, are still burning questions about animals and um, the before and after this living. See, uh, when it comes to animals, an animal is programmed in such a way that largely its life is uh, fixed around its survival process. Let's say, uh, for any creature for that matter, their stomach is full, their life is settled, they just sit there happily. But that's not the nature of the human being. Stomach is empty, only one problem, stomach is full, one hundred problems. This is the nature of the human being. Because survival is not the end game for us. Only when survival is taken care of, what is human kicks in. Till then, we are also just one more creature. When uh, we are absolutely hungry and survival is in question, we are like any other creature. Human beings fight like any other creatures when survival is in question. Only when those things are taken care of, other dimensions of being human become a possibility. So survival is not the end game for us, it is the beginning for us. It is the A of life, but for all other creatures, survival is the end game for us. But even among them, certain creatures are far more capable of accessing or at least being sensitive. I wouldn't say accessing, they're little more sensitive to consciousness. Wherever there is consciousness, certain creatures behave in a certain way. In India, in the yogic culture, in the Indian mysticism, everywhere you see there will be a cobra, always, simply because We've always seen wherever there is a little bit of, you know, access to consciousness, these creatures somehow sense it and they arrive. What makes them uh, sense it? One thing I'm guessing, this is not a certain science for me, I'm just guessing because they're stone deaf. I think they're super alert and some other… in some other sense, they're very, very alert. This is a fact, this has been uh, checked by a few people, See, for example, a cobra in southern India, it has no ears at all, no hearing mechanism, so it has got the whole body to the ground and literally ear to the ground, you know <laughs> So, if there is going to be an earthquake in California, which is literally twelve hours away, that means almost on the opposite side of the planet, if there is going to be an earthquake in the next two days or three days, this cobra will start behaving in a certain way. If you observe it carefully, if you have mastered that observation sufficiently, you can clearly tell that there is going to be uh, an earthquake in s approximately this kind of latitude. There are people who can do that. By simply observing the serpent, how it behaves, they say, 
there is going to be this kind of movement in some part of the planet. So because any littlest… In even the minutest vibrations in the planet, it is able to sense. So because of this, it has a certain uh, awareness or rather sensitivity to certain vibrations. Probably when somebody accesses what we are referring to as consciousness, the other vibrations which are normally everybody's uh, throwing out on a day-to-day -day basis, their physical stuff, their psychological stuff, probably that becomes minimal. Lack of that reverberation is something that a cobra senses. If you become very meditative, well, it won't happen in Belgium because there are no cobras there. But if you are in India, if you become med very meditative, you sit in a forest and become meditative, cobras will gather in front of you. They will come and sit there as if they're waiting for you. This is my personal experience any number of times. And this is… this will be vouched for by any number of yogis in the tradition always, because they're able to sense that lack of vibration in the person. When the vibrations become very minimal or very fine, somehow they're drawn to that. I feel uh, for a variety of reasons, because I'm, in my experience, I don't want to go into the detail now, but in my experience, all venomous creatures, those which create venom in their system, all of them are, con are able to sense this. Probably, you know, uh, uh, I'm, I'm just doing guesswork here, it's just uh, guesswork. See, some creature generates venom within itself as an evolutionary process, probably because in some way his uh, physical features and things are such that without a deadly venom, he wouldn't have survived. He is constantly threatened. So, because he's feeling so threatened, you, it's also true in human beings, those who are feeling always threatened, they will carry a lot of venom within themselves. So, looking at human behavior, I'm just guessing, maybe in the evolutionary process, because they don't have limbs, let us say the snakes don't have limbs, they don't have the same capabilities that other creatures have, so they might have developed venom over a period of time because otherwise they wouldn't have survived, otherwise they wouldn't have got food to eat, everything around them moves faster. But still they manage to hunt and live only because of the venom that they carry. All venomous creatures, I've noticed this with bees, you know, the honey bees, the way they behave around me, many, many times I've noticed is very strange. In the beginning when it happened, I couldn't believe how these insects seem to be sensing something which nobody else, you know, human beings don't know most of the time, but they're able to see it. I've generally noticed this with all venomous creatures because to generate that venom, there is some special process going on within them. From what I hear from other scientists and, uh, you know, people who are working in the field, they're saying venom is uh, uh, one of the most complex uh, proteins that are produced on the planet and today, for various neurological ailments, the experiments are going on how venom could be a solution in the future because, you know, in my personal experience, consuming venom has done miracles to me in terms of rejuvenating my body and doing things with myself in so many different ways. If you are… Uh, I don't know if you and Bala are not aware of this, there are certain type of yogis who always carry these mountain scorpions which are almost like nine inches long, uh, in a box, once in a way they will decide when, they will take a sting from the scorpion, your whole neurological system will jangle, it will go for twenty-four hours to forty-eight hours, it won't let you sleep, it will just keep you up. And between pain and pleasure, there is very little distinction. Once the neurological system gets tangled, you know, like jangled in a certain way, you can make it into pain, you can make it into pleasure consciously. So they will cry, they will laugh, they will cry, they will laugh, they will go through this for whole twenty-four to forty-eight hours because they are using the venom to just uh, shake up the whole neurological system. So having said that, somewhere certain creatures have little more access to these things. They may not have access to consciousness, but where there is access to consciousness, they are able to sense that. In my understanding or I would rather say my presumption is that, that they're able to uh, mark out those creatures or those bodies who are uh, least amount of reverberations in them.
where there is least amount of reverberation is like a little bit of a vacuum for them, so they are drawn towards that and at the same time they will not harm that, uh, you know, that kind of reverberation because they feel very passive. Like, uh, I don't know, right now in the video as I was watching it, there is a video where I am holding a king cobra, not by the head, but in the body, it is not a pet cobra or something. We've just caught it three… two, three days before that is being uh, filmed there. And king cobra, if it bites you, you have six to eight minutes to live, that's it. It has enough venom to kill an elephant, but it will not bite. It all depends, if you show a little anxiety, it'll bite you. If you are just absolutely calm, it will not touch you because it's going by the reverb that you generate. So, having said that, this consciousness as a dimension, let's call it a dimension, let's not call it as an experience of wakefulness and sleep, different levels of wakefulness. Well, even when you're awake, not everybody is awake to the same extent, isn't it? Suppose uh, you're teaching in a uh, university, right? Do you find all the students awake at the <laughs> to the same level? When I teach, <laughs> when I teach, yes, hyper-vigilant. <laughs> <laughs> he actually uses that analogy in, in his lectures. Well. He, goes to lecture and he, he uses that analogy where he picks his uh, participants in a lecture and he mm. analyzes and tells them, you're not this much awake and you're this much awake and alert. <laughs> to <attend his> own, <laughs> uh, <laughs> so, no two human beings are awake to the same extent. So, this whole dimension, if we change the terminology a little bit, probably it will fall into a little better place of understanding, maybe not entirely, but little better. That is, right now when we talk about anesthesia or even coma for that matter, they may be very similar, uh, I don't know medically how you differentiate between the two. Essentially, bodily functions have dropped step by step. In one person, a certain number of uh, functions might have dropped, in another person it might have dropped further, and I would take it further, even what you call as death is just further drop in the bodily functions. So whether it is death, coma, anesthesia, in my understanding and my experience of things, they are not very different. It is just different levels of profoundness of the same thing. When you become completely unawake, that means you're dead. You're little bit awake means you're in coma. You're little more awake means you're under the influence of anesthesia. Little more awake means you just had a drink. <laughs> and your experience, but you have not yet died. <laughs> uh, let's not go into that now. Uh, we'll go into it some other day because uh, you, you… are you in Brussels? Yes, close to Brussels. Okay, so unless… unless you serve me french fries, I'm not going to talk all those things to you right now. <laughs> <laughs> I will offer you French fries and Belgian chocolate. <laughs> Strange country. But, uh... <clears throat> there are people who are seriously affected by what's called a Sarpadoshan. Knowing this, uh, when you say Sarpadosha, usually it affects the skin. Today, modern medicine dismissed as rubbish, superstitious. But uh, we can get you certain cases of skin ailment. Do what you want, you cannot diagnose what it is. For sure you cannot cure with your medicine, whatever kind of medicine you can. And it's not very rare, it's, it's quite odd in many ways. So, there are certain other aspects in nature which affects one's health and well-being. There is in our body, the five elements on a subtler level have manifested themselves as panchaprana, so the five forms of basic energy in the system. One aspect of it is very directly and closely related to 
what would happen to a snake. To understand this, we have to see it this way. It is only in your mind that you think you are a separate piece of mind. As far as this planet is concerned, you, the insect, the worm, the snake, the elephant, the buffalo, and the tree and everything is same. It just throws itself out in many different ways and sucks it back. You have ideas about yourself. Similarly, ant has ideas about itself. But as far as the earth is concerned, it bursts out in the form of various types of lives and sucks it back when it's time. All your ideas, no matter what kind of ideas you have about yourself, when the Mother Earth decides to suck you back, where do your ideas go? You could have written a book, somebody else reads it and gets confused. But uh, all of them, all kinds, have been sucked back, isn't it? Every kind. As far as the Earth is concerned, you the worm, the insect, the snake, the bird, the tree, it's all the same stuff. The idea that I am this is your idea. Doesn't matter who you are, it will suck you back and need you as a part of itself. Nobody has gone anywhere else except here, isn't it? So, the energy is the same. The material is the same. You and the snake, you and the insect are made the same way. So nobody can claim it is all that you are something distinct life. It is not distinct life, it is… Even according to science you can see, all of us are made of carbon as far as… Hmm? Are you made of silicon? No. So, it is all the same stuff, made the same way. From a single cell in a leaf, in a plant, to yours, it's not very different, it's just evolution. Little different grade, that's all, same stuff. So, because of certain reasons, it so happens that your Vyana, Vyana Vayu, or the Vyana Prana, behaves in a certain way. So, your skin becomes like that of a reptile. So when that happens, we say, you have Navadosa. So, there are various ways to get rid of this. You know, in India, there are people that if you have a snake bite, Just by uttering a mantra, they will relieve you of your poison. Do you know this? Long distance. You heard of this man who became very famous, Romani, Karnataka. Huh? A station master. All you have to do is call him on the phone and tell him your name and what snake. From where he is, he will relieve your breath, poison. It's… it is a proven fact, it's no more a joke. This is not the first one, there have been any number of people like this. So, one way of understanding life is the chemistry of it. Another way of understanding life, a much subtler way of knowing life is the energy of it. So when we say Sarpadosh, we are talking about the energy. It's become like that of a reptile. Do you know in your brain, is a reptilian brain. You have about this size of your brain, is that of a reptile. Within your brain, there is a brain which is about the size of a… something like a crocodile's brain. All this is not human brain, there is a reptilian brain inside. So that reptile can manifest itself because your energies begin to function in a certain way and that can be relieved by doing certain things. Why in the Bhairavi temple we set up Sarpa Seva and the Sarpa Seva is done with the termite hill earth. You know this? 
reducing the termite hill earth that is there. Put them. What do you call it? Put them in. So with that people are doing the the surplus here. So it can be relieved. The simple shift in your energy. So is it because some snake cursed you? So that is just a dialectical way of looking at it. Is it a superstition that a snake cursed you? That's not the point. It is just a certain way of expression. Now I am talking the language of modern science in a different way. Now I am talking about this energy changing in a certain way, your reptilian brain and all this. In a way, it's a curse from the snake. When you get it, it's a curse, isn't it? When you have it, it is very much a curse, isn't it? So this is just a, a dialectical expression. It is not that some snake is sitting somewhere and cursing you, but there is an element of you which is very much a reptile. There is an element of you which is very much a fish. There is an element of you which is very much an animal and they can play up. Nobody can deny, even modern science cannot deny that all these animals exist within you in some dormant form, isn't it? The evolutionary process is very much present in the body and uh, they can come alive for various reasons. It is a curse from the snake. Curse from the snake does not mean there is a snake sitting outside and cursing you. There is a snake sitting inside and cursing you. And that can be dealt with in a certain way because it is quite a common problem. That's the reason why we set up the Sarpa Seva for the people. temples. So there are most Tamaravan, Another one, Sattva, what is it? Kerala, the very famous temple. Hmm? Manar? Manarshala. Manarshala. Manarshala, whatever that is. That is, that's a very famous snake temple. So everywhere they set up this thing so that people could work it out. And in the process of evolution, reptile is a very significant aspect. And in the evolution of the being, snake is a very important step. And because of that, that's a reason why in India if you happen to kill a snake, you give it a funeral, you know. People actually give it a funeral, you know. Yeah. Yes, they put a coin, a milk, ghee, whatever. Whatever you do for the people, a human being, you do that because uh, it is closely related to you on one level. Well, modern expression is you have a reptilian brain. The yogic expression is in the evolution of the being, snake is an important step. So you have to keep it in a certain way, otherwise it will come alive within you. Snakes hold significant cultural and religious symbolism in various parts of the world, leading to their worship in different regions. Here are few examples. West Africa West Africa boasts a diverse array of cultures, each with its unique traditions and beliefs surrounding snakes. In many West African societies, snakes hold a reverse statue and are often associated with spirituality, healing and protection. Python Worship The python, one of the largest snake species, found in the region occupies a central role in many West African cultures. It is often regarded as a sacred creature symbolizing fertility, wisdom and the interconnectedness of life. Communities living in close proximity of pythons often develop rituals and ceremonies to honor and appease these majestic serpents. Ancestral Connection Snakes are sometimes believed to be the embodiment of ancestral spirits of deities. They are seen as meditators between the physical world and the spiritual realm, capable of bestowing blessings or delivering divine messages. Consequently, rituals involving snake worship often serve as a means of communicating with ancestors and seeking their guidance and protection. 
healing practices. In some West African societies, traditional healers or shamans harness the power of snakes for medicinal purposes. Snake venoms believed to possess potent healing properties are utilized in various remedies and treatments. Additionally, snake motifs may adorn healing paraphernalia or ceremonial objects, reinforcing the spiritual connection between snakes and healing practices. Cultural Festivals Throughout West Africa, communities celebrate festivals and ceremonies dedicated to snake worship. These events often involve elaborate rituals, music, dance and offerings to honor the serpents and invoke their blessings. Such festivals serve as occasions for communal bonding, spiritual renewal and the reaffirmation of cultural identity. Southeast Asia Southeast Asia is home of rich tapestry of cultures where snakes feature prominently in religious beliefs, folklore and daily life. From the majestic temples of Angkor Wat to the bustling streets of Bangkok, the region's reverence for snakes is palpable. Naga Iconography Naga's mythical serpent beings hold a special place in the religious and cultural landscape of Southeast Asia. Depicted as serpents or dragons, Nagas are revered as protectors of Buddhism and guardians of sacred sites. Temples and shrines throughout the region are adorned with elaborate Naga sculptures reflecting their importance in local cosmology. Cultural Syncretism Southeast Asia's diverse cultural heritage has led to the blending of indigenous beliefs with Hinduism and Buddhism. This syncretic approach is evident in the region's snake worship practices where local traditions intersect with broader religious frameworks. Snakes are often venerated as manifestations of divine forces or as embodiments of natural elements such as water and fertility. Ritual Offerings Devotees in Southeast Asia offer prayers, incense and floral garlands to snake deities and spirits as acts of reverence and supplication. Rituals may include the pouring of water, milk or rice over serpent statues or the lightings of candles to honor their divine presence. Such offerings are believed to invoke blessings, prosperity and protection from malevolent forces. Snake Handling Traditions In some parts of Southeast Asia, snake handling traditions persist where practitioners interact with venomous snakes as part of religious rituals or performances. These practices often require specialized knowledge, skill and spiritual guidance, emphasizing the importance of respect and caution when engaging with snakes. Native American Cultures The indigenous peoples of North and South America have maintained deep spiritual connections with the natural world, including snakes or millennia. Across the continent, snakes are revered as symbols of wisdom, transformation and spiritual power. Sacred Serpents Snakes are often regarded as sacred beings in Native American cultures representing both the earthly and spiritual realms. They are seen as intermediaries between humans and the divine, capable of imparting knowledge, healing and guidance. In some traditions, snakes are associated with deities or ancestral spirits, while in others they embody natural forces such as rain, fertility or the underworld. Ceremonial Practices Ceremonies involving snakes are central to many Native American traditions, serving as occasions for spiritual renewal, communal bonding and cultural continuity. Snake dances, vision quests are conducted with reverence and respect for the serpent's power and wisdom. Participants may invoke the aid of snake spirits through prayer, song or ritual offerings, seeking blessings from themselves and their communities. Ancient Egypt, with its iconic pyramids, pharaohs and hieroglyphs, is renowned for its rich religious traditions and elaborate funerary practices. Within this ancient civilization, snakes held a special place in the pantheons of gods and the collective imagination of the people. Symbol of Divine Power Snakes are associated with several deities in ancient Egyptian mythology, embodying both protective and destructive forces. The cobra, known as the Uraeus, was a symbol of royalty and divine authority, often depicted on the crowns of pharaohs as a sign of divine lineage and a connection to the gods, guardians of the underworld. Snakes were believed to inhabit the realm of the dead and serve as guardians of the afterlife. The serpent goddess Vajje was associated with the underworld, the realm of the dead. Snakes were also depicted on funerary objects and tomb walls and protectors of the deceased, ensuring safe passage to the afterlife. Cosmic Symbolism Snakes held cosmic significance in ancient Egyptian cosmology, representing concepts such as eternity, regeneration and cyclical nature of existence. The image of the Ouroboros, a serpent eating its own tail, symbolized the eternal cycle of life, death and rebirth, reflecting the interconnectedness of all things in the universe. Sacred Serpents Snakes were venerated as manifestations of divine energy and were worshipped in temples and shrines throughout ancient Egypt. Ceremonies dedicated to snake deities such as the Feast of Vajay were conducted with pomp and reverence, offering prayers and rituals to honor the serpent and seek their blessings.